Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. It's so nice to have you here on a sunny day, at least it's sunny in London after months and months of grey and cold. Thank you for joining this Opera Staria Trust, Transparency and Technology webinar this morning. My name is Jen Rodvold and I am head of Sopristeria's Ethics and Sustainability Consulting Practice. We're a team of responsible business and technology experts who help uh, organizations across the public sector, so central government, defense, um, retail, in private sector, financial services and healthcare, um, embed purpose people and a focus on planet in their strategies to create shared value using data, technology, and a human-centered approach. So today we're gonna to talk about some, some research that the team has done late last year on how the UK public sector is approaching digital ethics, where it's at in terms of adopting the digital ethics agenda and how mature um, digital ethics is across UK public services. I'm joined today by Kevin McNish. Kevin, do you want to introduce yourself? Thanks, Jen. Hi, yes, as Jen said, my name is Kevin McNish. I am a former academic uh, turned consultant in digital ethics, and I head up the digital ethics work that Sopris Area does within Jen's team. So thanks, Jen. Great, thank you, Kevin. Um, so just a word about uh, today and about Sopristeria. So we will be um, taking questions at the end, but if you've got them in mind, you can pop them in um, the stream using the Slido function. You can see we're recording. Um, so the session is recorded uh, from start to finish. And if you'd like to use the closed caption function, there's a little uh, icon in the bottom left of your screen that you can turn on. Sometimes my American accent is not that easy to understand, so please feel free to use it. It can be helpful. Um, if you haven't seen the reports that today's webinar uh, is based on, you can find those on our website at sopristeria.co.uk. So just very quickly about Sopristeria, we're a digital services company um, headquartered in France, um, but with about 7,000 employees in the UK, as I say, serving central government, financial services, retail, defense and security, and healthcare. Um, we operate in about 30 countries around the world though, and we do everything from consulting to business process services to systems integration, um, taking social value and a human-centered approach across everything we do. Um, quickly about the agenda, Kevin, if you don't mind going on to the next slide, just to give you an overview of what you're you're in for today. Kevin's going to talk about what digital ethics actually is, what it means to software stereo, and how we're approaching it in our work um, in those sectors. Then we'll get into the research. We'll give a quick overview of the two complementary reports. And um, Kevin and I will share some thoughts on our recent work on digital ethics across all of those sectors and we'll open it up to questions. There's a lot happening driving the digital ethics agenda, so we can't wait to get to your questions. Um, so I think without further ado, I will pass on to Kevin. Yep, thank you, Jen. So uh, as you said, yeah, digital ethics really is about understanding the risks and opportunities that technology poses us. It focuses on the impacts of technology on people, society and the environment together and takes a systematic approach to trying to understand these impacts, avoiding or mitigating the negatives and trying to accentuate the positives where we can. I think crucially, and this will come up as we speak, digital ethics goes beyond data ethics in that the areas of concern are not necessarily data related. So, as I said, there are issues around the environment. We could think about accessibility or impact on the workplace. And with many clients, we found that after GDPR, there's an increasing awareness of data ethics issues, and perhaps worryingly a sense that if there's no personal data involved in a project, then there aren't any data, any ethical issues, but far less awareness of digital ethics more generally. So at its heart, what digital ethics is trying to do is to look at organizational transformation to manage risk and improve services. And in so doing, to be able to review what's fundamental to a business in terms of values um, and what, what the business is really trying to achieve, but these things are often ignored. So 
where that plays in with trust, as you can see, we've called this trust, transparency and technology, is that we tend to trust systems and people in two ways. We firstly trust that they do what they promise they will do, but we also trust that they won't harm us, that they will act in our best interests. And it's that second element, trust not to harm, that is really the ethical element. And as we've seen from numerous cases we could, we could pull up, where trust, uh, where ethics, sorry, suffers, then trust suffers as well. And again, I think we'll probably get into more of those later. But a, re a fairly recent example would be facial recognition systems, where we've recognized that quite a lot of facial recognition systems in the market um, are biased. And as that information comes out, then we trust those systems less and less. So the webinar today focuses on these two reports here, the government view and the citizen view of trust, transparency and technology. As Jen said, these are freely available on the Softrust area websites. I would encourage you to go and download them if you can. Uh, but I will start off by talking about the government view and then Jen will take over looking at the citizen view. So to get an idea of where government was at, or is at rather, with digital ethics, we carried out qualitative interviews with senior members of government departments, including the Department of Health and Social Care, the Home Office, DEFRA, Bayes, Department for Trade, the Scottish Government, and, and others. And to carry out these interviews, we designed keystone questions around our, um, our own digital ethics maturity model, covering seven areas critical to digital ethics. And the goal of what we were trying to do was to complement ongoing work by CDBO, um, Central Digital and Data Office, the um, CDEI, um, Central Data Ethics and Informa uh, Ethics Information, and to drive other progress in digital ethics adoption more generally. And in this, we were supported by the ODI, which was the Open Data Institute which was extremely helpful, and we're very thankful for their help throughout it. Some of the core findings which we came out with are firstly that digital ethics clearly drives quality. It drives quality in terms of the data that people are receiving and what they do with that data. So if people know why they're trying to collect data or why they're trying to engage in a particular program, that helps them to take that program more seriously and to work with it better. However, some people uh, we spoke to are resisting pushing forward with digital ethics because they're looking for more central guidance. And we think there are a couple of dangers with this. Firstly, that that risks harm occurring in the meantime because people are already engaging with technology very clearly and harms could arise through that engagement. Inadvertent harms, absolutely. But unless you have good guardrails put in place, those harms are always going to be a risk. Secondly, there's an opportunity to move forward with digital ethics now rather than have it centrally imposed in a way that would allow you to contextualize what you were doing. So rather than have some central um, form of putting uh, digital ethics in place, you can take it now and create a contextualized version which works for your department or your company wherever we're coming from and of course this fits very closely with the uk's ai white paper which is about devolving responsibility for ai positively we found some very strong foundations in government departments uh, those government departments that already engage with the public had some good stakeholder engagement admittedly this tended to be a one-off engagement rather than iterative so there's still room for improvement, but some departments were engaging with stakeholders to understand harms and potential issues. Others had some good governance in place regarding how ethics should be examined and ensured that it, it is a part of the process. But in many cases, those were optional or not known about throughout the whole department. So once more, opportunities to develop, but good foundations to build off. More concerningly, None of the departments which we spoke to were looking at procurement in terms of an ethical perspective. So what often happens, and this isn't just restricted to government, is that people will accept the uh, sales pitches of companies that are trying to provide applications, software, hardware, and not go through a rigorous uh, system of checks to ensure that there are no ethics risks there. And so there's an opportunity of 
ethics risks being inadvertently imported into a company or a department through procurement. We also saw a great need for more inclusive and accessibility technology uh, throughout government. Many departments are disability confident, that is, they help, in, um, they, they help to make the most of opportunities provided by employing disabled people, but they didn't have reliable or accessible technology uh, and often have fairly weak systems for supporting people with accessible tech. And so that's an area which also needs consideration. And then finally, um, no departments that we spoke to had a digital ethics strategy. And obviously, from what we've been saying, that's a, a really powerful way of bringing all of these considerations together, making sure that you're not missing areas such as procurement or such as accessibility and having a, a unified, integrated approach going forward. So that's a quick overview of what the government uh, view was. And again, there's much more in the report, but I'll hand back to Jen now to talk about the citizen view. Thanks, Kevin. Super interesting. Can't wait to pick up some of those points with you. Um, so on the citizen view, we surveyed around a thousand UK citizens across various demographics. So getting a representative sample in terms of age and socioeconomic um, status in, in this survey. And the, the real driver for this research was to understand um, citizens' values, perceptions, and beliefs when it comes to government digital services, well, public, se public sector digital services across the board, and their use of data. Um, we see, we hear a lot about trust these days when it comes to anything, but especially digital services and, and data use. There are lots and lots of studies on this. And our interest is really around um, aligning trust to um, it, digital ethics strategies and helping organizations understand what drives trust so that um, organizations can make greater use of data in the right way while building trust. Because data is essential to so many organizations' uh, digital transformation strategies. So um, echoing a lot of the trust surveys out there that aren't specifically about digital technology or data use, our survey also showed that generally trust is declining and specifically trust in um, public sector digital services is declining at a time when most government organizations are wanting to make use, make greater use of technology and make greater use of data um, because those things offer a lot of promise to um, public, public service efficiency and public services quality, as Kevin said. Um, and what we're seeing is that that distrust is fairly universal, so low levels of trust across the board. There was only a small majority of people who um, said that they trust, the, trust current um, public sector digital services and data use. That trust, that there's a trust gap that opens up when we dug into some of the data um, from an age perspective and socioe socioeconomic perspective. Um, that was really, really interesting. So people in the younger age bracket generally distrusted um, public sector organizations less in general, but trusted them more when it came to using technology and data. Um, on the other hand, older people um, trusted public sector organizations more in general, but distrusted digital technologies and, and use of data. And there's some interesting um, hypotheses we might go to based on that data. So are younger people, because they're more likely to be digital natives, just um, more relaxed about digital technology in general and giving their data because that's what they've always known and perhaps um, not having been around very long, they haven't yet experienced any downsides to it. Um, and are older people just less familiar with digital technology? We don't have anything to anything other than the facts in front of you to go on, but those are some of the hypotheses um, that we're working with. There's some there's some interesting layers though in the age gap. Um, young people declare that they use that they read privacy policies and terms and conditions on websites, not just in public services, but um, including in public services more regularly, 32% say they always read privacy policies and terms and conditions, which personally I find really, really hard to believe. 
<laughs> but um, we've got to go with that for now. It, it'll be interesting to to dig into that one. But that might be um, one source of trust. They they see that they get the information they need when it comes to what the trade off is in giving data and how their data is being used. Whereas um, people in other age brackets didn't. Uh, claim to read privacy policies and do have higher levels of distrust. There are some interesting figures coming back when, when we start to use different terminology as well. So using terms like data-driven decision-making, algorithms, and AI um, impacts levels of trust negatively. So most people in across the age bracket say that um, they distrust the government and, and public sector bodies to use data-driven decision-making, whatever that means, um, algorithms and AI technology specifically. Um, so I think that there's some interesting discussion maybe we can have today around how we change perceptions around those technologies and explain what's really happening when we use um, decision-making te technologies, algorithms and AI. Um, and then another interesting finding was about how people generally don't want um, to give very much of their data and, and mistrust government use of data in terms of how it will be used fairly to affect decisions, uh, to make decisions about them, but are more trusting of public sector bodies to use other people's data to make decisions about other people, specifically when asked about things like um, surveilling protesters, um, and uh, in getting information about benefits, benefits claimants. So um, perhaps some bias seeps in there. It's not a universal um, uh, resistance to using data. We found that citizens are asking public sector organizations to go beyond compliance. Um, so taking steps beyond what is already protected in law by GDPR and the Data Protection Act. And again, that raises some interesting questions about what is understood by the general public, what is protected, what do those regulations really offer? Um, I think it's probably fair to say that the, the, the bad news stories, the data breaches and, um, and problems that all sectors have had with data leaks and privacy breaches and hacks are what sticks in the mind. There aren't any really good news stories about data protection. That's not what makes the headlines. So that might be driving some of that. Um, but on the other hand, taking an ethical approach and showing that you're going beyond basic compliance really does seem to be what citizens are asking for. And all of this really boils down to communicating more effectively about what data is being used, how technology is being used, and um, also making sure that we're designing these services for citizens' best interest. We'll talk about that when Kevin and I get into the discussion a bit more, creating a shared value proposition when it comes to data use and digital services. So Kevin, I think um, I'd like to go back to you now with a question based on something you said. So we've heard just in, in what I was covering on the citizen side um, about what citizens think. And I think it would be really interesting to hear a bit more about what you were saying in terms of how um, joined up thinking is within government departments on digital ethics and maybe even across government departments what's happening in terms of knowledge sharing internally and across departments and organizations? Yeah, thanks, Jen. So I think that internally, it's very much, from what we've seen so far, it's very much internal to each department. I'm not sure that there's much going across the departments. Um, although there are, again, principles that are being shared across departments from the AI white paper, and then again, bodies like CDDO. Um, but within departments, there's specific work being done and, and quite good work that, that's coming along. So I think the forthcoming AI Act is helping to shape people's minds and shape people's thinking quite a bit. And so we have seen some developments there in terms of teams starting to be formed, which are growing, looking at how to integrate policy with existing structures and processes. Um, and starting to create things like AI and algorithm registers, uh, model card templates and things like that to be able to get their heads around it. But it very much depends on which department you're talking to. So as I say, there are some 
um, such as DWP or Home Office, which engage with the public quite often, who may be ahead on some of those stakeholder facing uh, discussions and others uh, who are, are less publicly engaged, who are probably behind on that side of things. However, there are other areas such as governance um, where those other departments may be, may be developing further and may have good systems in place. It would be good to see, I think, more joined up thinking um, coming from them. And as I say, trying to keep that balance between the the impetus from the centre, but without um, everything coming from the centre. I think losing that contextual dependency would be a tremendous loss. So, Jen, coming, coming back to you, um, and also want to take this a little bit further out from government itself. I know we've been doing a fair amount of work with financial services on digital ethics and trust as well. So what similarities have you seen between some of the findings that we've just been talking about and the work that you've been doing with financial services? Thanks, Kevin. Uh, it's it's really god gobsmackingly um, similar. <laughs> to coin a phrase that's not very easy to say. It's <laughs> the, the research we've done with um, banking clients consistently shows similarities um, in terms of opinions and, and views expressed in our citizen research, primarily around um, feeling like um, there's not a shared value, that, that things are imbalanced in favor of the, the larger organization compared to the individual citizen or, or the customer when it comes to engaging with digital or um, indeed giving data. So in, in research with banks, we've learned that um, banking customers feel that banks make it intentionally um, difficult to uh, engage with digital services, um, primarily out of a, a sense of feeling like um, they'd want to hide their cards when it comes to how decisions are made, um, keep their cards close to their chest when it comes to how decisions are made, and um, in, in terms of cost cutting measures and driving everything to digital and making things less accessible and not able to talk to um, a human. And all of that really reduces trust um, and the, the relationship people feel they have with their bank. Um, again, some similarities, banking customers feel, felt at the outset that they understood how their data was being used, but when we asked them questions, to test that knowledge, it was revealed that, in fact, they didn't really understand that, and not just in terms of um, uh, not understanding what, uh, how data that they gave was used in the decision-making process, but also kind of taking leaps and assuming that organizations were going out and searching for data that the customer hadn't given the bank intentionally, so like social media scraping, and that's something specifically that came up in in the citizen research as well. So there's almost a sense of um, paranoia or, um, or fear that big organizations are taking more than they're legally allowed to do and that citizens would want them to do anyway. Um, on the more positive side, we found that citizens are actually, customers, banking customers like citizens are actually willing to give data under cer certain circumstances. Um, and what drives that is a sense of this shared value proposition that I related to that I that I mentioned earlier. So um, in the financial services world, it was when banking customers felt like they might be offered better, more appropriate products to their situation or give it be given better terms. And interestingly, people expressed a real interest in um, in being part of something bigger. So they would give data if financial services organizations would be able to use that for some greater purpose, like driving greater financial inclusion. So not just to benefit themselves, but to benefit people who um, might have trouble accessing standard um, financial products. So that was really interesting. So there's a real kind of social purpose element to yeah. this as well. Um, Kevin, I do want to come back to your point about the importance of strategy um, and context and whether it's appropriate to have a one-size-fits-all kind of digital ethics strategy for UK government organisations or not, but um, I think some of our uh, audience will be really interested in a point you made given um, what we're seeing with the, the hype around AI right now on procurement. So. 
um, procurement and public sector commissioning buys ton buys in tons and tons of third party technology. Can you say more about that risk that came up in in the research and where else you're seeing it outside of public sector? Yeah, sure. So um, yeah, it is concerning. Uh, and the the analogy which I always have in the back of my mind is the hack that happened on Target the eighth largest retailer in the US back in 2013. Now, admittedly, that, that was 10 years ago, but um, it resulted in 70 million records of personal data being lost and 40 million credit card records being lost. And in the first two months after the hack, it cost Target $200 million. Now, Target itself had a fantastic cybersecurity system in place. Um, I wouldn't say it was unhackable, nobody is, but it was very, very powerful. The way the hackers got into Target was they hacked a very small subcontractor that was providing air conditioning support to Target stores. And that subcontractor was connected in with Target's bigger system. Uh, and there wasn't security put in place in that particular instance. And that was how they got into Target. And I think the analogy holds through into procurement for ethical issues as well. You can have the best ethical governance and systems in place but if you have a supplier giving you an unethical system or unethical data, then you're going to be importing those unethical issues and challenges into your organization. So say, for example, you're sourcing data from suppliers who are not doing due diligence, then you may find that you're getting biased data sets coming in. And if you then don't do due diligence on those data sets as well, that bias will continue into what you are doing. Um, Likewise, for checking any applications, uh, tools that come along and do fairness checking or search for personal um, identifiable information, personal data, that sort of thing. If there's nothing going on to double check the, um, the state of what's being procured from suppliers, then there is a problem. And obviously for people you know, on this call and elsewhere who are those suppliers, that just ups the game for us thinking, well, yes, we need to be doing that due diligence ourselves as well in order the government can trust us to be providing that information. And I think the solution there is really to um, work to ensure that the whole system is ethical um, and that we're thinking about, as you mentioned, Jen, an ethics by design approach where ethics is just central to everything that we do. Um, from the very initial sort of gathering of requirements to gathering of data, processing data, and, and so on throughout the whole process. Ethics just needs to be suffused throughout the process, which to me says that this is not a technical problem primarily, it's a cultural or social problem that we need to be thinking about. To go back to my earlier point around organizational change, we need to be thinking about this at the organizational level in order to truly come to grips with this and make sure that what we are doing is to people's benefit and not inadvertently to their harm. So, Jen, I think we've possibly got time for one more um, question in our discussion here. I just wanted to come back to the, the point which you raised, which I think for me was one of the most striking issues of the citizen research, was that 70% figure uh, around citizens expecting government to go beyond um, the, the law when it came to data regulation. Uh, do you have any further reflections on that? It is really, really interesting. I mean, as I say, um, it it suggests a a perception that the the law is not enough, and that organisations aren't, and and perhaps um, that organisations aren't acting on it. And I don't think that's right. I mean, everyone we spoke to, both in for this research and beyond, has been working really tirelessly on G GDPR. Um, for quite some time, many years now, data protection is taken quite seriously. But as I say, it's the, the bad news stories that stick in people's minds. And um, I, GDPR and data protection doesn't cover everything as we know. And I, you know, maybe it's for you, maybe to Kev Kevin to uh, elaborate on that point. It, it, compliance with data protection laws does not mean you are taking an ethical approach to data. Um, I, I will invite you to comment on that since you're the privacy um, expert. But what I will say is that throughout 
everything we've talked about today, pretty much, especially in the citizen research, there's a job for us to do in taking a more human-centered approach to technology design and service delivery in general. And um, that is actually at the heart of any digital ethics good practice, understanding how citizens, how banking customers, how, how your users understand these services to work is um, in alignment with the, the digital ethics principles that have been put out by global organizations well before the AI Act um, came, came into our focus. So principles of explainability and transparency. But the thing is, it's not easy. And a lot of the focus has been put on explaining technical things to other technical people. And the job to do is to make this make explainability really be focused on end users who aren't necessarily um, technologists, coders, um, computer scientists, data scientists. We have to make it accessible, not only because that's where the law is going, but that's also where the value is created in terms of the trust that we're talking about. Um, so I think that that's something that we have to work on is how we embed ethics, trust, explainability, transparency into the user experience by embedding ethics. Mm -hmm. And so, Kevin, do you want to take a minute just to build on the um, data, data protection compliance versus data protection from an ethical perspective? Yeah, sure. So I, I think that, you know, I think GDPR is great for me personally. I think it's a great piece of legislation. Uh, for all the difficulties that it has presented, and, and those difficulties are significant. We have seen clients who are not innovating um, because of it, and we've seen clients who've been told by their uh, data protection officers that they cannot do something when they actually can. Um, and so there are challenges out there around it. Um, but I think one of one of the core things is that the GDPR defines personal data in terms of data which can be used to identify a living person. Now, automatically, that runs into problems of people who are recently deceased and uh, accessing data from them. That's not covered by GDPR. But perhaps a larger consideration, and this is something which has really come out as other countries have developed their own equivalent data protection legislation, is the protection of groups which can come from um, groups can be harmed by the use of data, which is freely given, which is given with consent or, or whatever, um, but nonetheless has an impact back on them. So an example which I, I sort of have as a go to there is research. I think it was carried out on African-Americans in the 1970s in Southern California, which showed that they had on average a 10 point lower IQ than white Americans in Southern California in the 1970s. And you know, there are all sorts of reasons for this in terms of education, um, opportunities, uh, nutrition, whatever else. But it was used, you know, the, the information was probably freely given by those people who engaged in the IQ surveys, but it was then used for very racist ends by people in, in painfully obvious ways as to how it might be used and abused. And I think it's just a, a salutary reminder that even when information and data is given with consent, that doesn't necessarily make the end use of it ethical. And there are, there are numerous points throughout the processing um, and use of data where ethical problems can arise. And so it's not purely a matter of something which is covered by GDPR. We do need to go further and think more intelligently about it. And as I said at the beginning, it, it's more than, you know, we, we need to be thinking about more than just data ethics as well. In the last month, IBM uh, and British Telecom have both announced that they're cutting somewhere in the region of 10 or 11,000 jobs each, which they see as being down to AI being able to come in and replace people. We know recently that uh, use of chat GPT, I think it's about 25 minutes of use of chat GPT or training chat GPT uses something like 700,000 litres of water in terms of cooling the systems and so on. So there, there are broader considerations than just the data. We need to be thinking about the environment. We need to be thinking about jobs. We need to be thinking about the impact on society that technology is having and really having these discussions, not only through sort of civil society and government groups, but also within, indus in, within industry as well to determine where we want to go and what we want to be doing for society. 
And I think with that, Jen, that probably takes us nicely then to some time for Q and A. Indeed, um, we've got some great questions coming in. Excellent. What a good, what a great audience we've got. Um, so, okay, let's start with a biggie. <laughs> Nick May says, very interesting, curious to know which stakeholders you think should be leading digital ethics strategy. Does it need a dedicated executive to have a meaningful impact? That's such a good question. I, I will add my view and Kevin, if you want to, to give yours as well. Um, Nick, we're seeing that sponsors for digital ethics pop up everywhere. Um, so there, there is no single place for this now, no natural place for this now in terms of, you know, where, um, where things seem, the trends, where things seem to be going. Um, we've seen digital ethics started in uh, data teams, data and analytics teams. We've seen it started in um, digital transformation teams, of course, but even in, in finance, legal, risk and compliance uh, teams. So it, it can sit in lots of different places. Um, I do, I think Kevin will probably agree, we, we think that having executive level sponsorship is super important, especially for organizations that are perhaps more mature in terms of um, data and technology adoption. So the further along they are with their digital and data strategy, the more it makes sense to have executive sponsorship. And this also stems out of our view that digital ethics is not um, really about technology or data explicitly. It's ultimately about people and business strategy. So um, a joined up approach across an organization that integrates into a corporate strategy or, or sector stra um, organizational strategy is really important. Um, but on the other hand, starting somewhere for those that haven't started is also important. So some of the organizations we organ uh, we interviewed had a very organic approach to um, where they started and had made great made great strides through the powers of influence and persuasion and showing results. So don't get um, I, I wouldn't I would just add don't um, don't fall into inaction because you don't have an executive sponsor. Kevin, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, sure. I, I just pick up on your point, Jen, there about it being about culture. And as we know, culture is led from the top. Uh, I think there, there's fairly conclusive evidence about that now. And so it just makes life so much easier if you have an executive sponsor. Now, it's not to say, as Jen said, that you can't have grassroots action within an organization pushing up from the bottom, and that can and has led to change in organizations uh, so it's possible it's just a lot harder having an executive sponsor on board means that you're more likely to be able to get the money to do what you want to do and ultimately to be able to change the organization in the way that you need to or to be able to put the guardrails in place across the organization which are needed otherwise you you risk having sort of small pockets as i say of a grassroots approach these small pockets trying to come out with solutions themselves which may be very effective, but then only operate within their small area of um, of influence. And so I think definitely executive sponsorship is, is helpful. But again, to echo Jen's point, that's not to say don't do anything if you don't have it. Just try to bring executives on board with you if you're making those changes. Great. Um, a quick comment from Craig Wentworth. Thanks, Craig. It's heartening to hear that citizens are saying go beyond compliance and the example of banking customers being prepared to give more data if they're assured that it's being used for some social purpose. I completely agree, Craig. That was really, really heartening to hear. Um, We've got a good one for you, Kevin, from Hank Marsman, who says, can you elaborate perhaps a bit on ethics and values and how an organization, um, how in an organization those translate to rules, law, and how you keep those back and forth going to ensure that the rules don't become values. So I know this is a conversation we've had a lot about where compliance ends and ethics begins and, and how, how you manage that. So over to you, Kevin. Yeah, thank you. That that's thanks, Jen, <laughs> and thank you, Hank. Those are, as it, as I think you know, Hank. That's a very tough one right now. Um, a, as a former academic philosopher, I was involved in sort of helping to come out with some of the principles that um, are now taken as, as as read for this is what 
ethics needs to be around technology. But um, where philosophy tended to stop in academia was, well, we've done our bit, we've come out with the principles. And I think for the last four or five years in industry and academia, the challenge has really come about how do we embed those in practice, which is exactly what you're asking about here. How do we go from saying, okay, your, your, your data or your algorithm needs to be transparent. So what does that actually look like? And again, without what is sound too much like a stuck record, I think the crucial thing there is back to culture. Because uh, to come back to your point, Hank, if you don't have the culture in place, then it does become a checkbox exercise. And then the rules do become values in themselves and people start um, acting up to the rule and treating the rule by the letter rather than by the spirit. Uh, and then that, that that's not gonna solve anything. Uh, you're still going to end up with unethical practices um, or the risk of people being harmed as a result of what you're doing. And so, it just comes back to stressing that point that that if the organization doesn't get ethics at its core, then you're going to have a very strong uphill struggle. And I think most organizations do. Most people genuinely do want to do good in the world. There are all sorts of careers and jobs we could be doing which are unethical and which will probably all make us a lot more money. So I think that there are ways forward. Um, and people do care about this stuff. It's just a matter of both raising the awareness of what some of the ethical risks are and raising an awareness about the, the, the scale of those risks. And I think GDPR has done that very, very effectively in terms of what is done with personal data. I think the AI Act will continue to do that in terms of how we use algorithms. But as Jen said, going back to this 70% statistic, which I found so remarkable, is this need to go beyond the compliance and say, okay, compliance is a starting point here. But what we really need to do is embed our values to show, apart from anything else, just to use as a differentiator for your company. Why are you different? Why should I buy from you? And we are seeing more and more customers, investors, and employees all saying that they will walk if they don't think that a company has ethical values, which it practices. And being found of guilty of ethics washing um, or putting up window dressing, which doesn't have the substance behind it, is leading to people leaving organizations, whether they're customers or clients or employees or investors. And so we are seeing challenges there. Um, possibly one of the most recent examples being the 10% uh, share loss that Alphabet went through after Google released BARD. And many of the problems came up with BARD uh, very publicly, and that led to, to say, this, this share price drop. So I think it's, it's crucial that we don't look at this as a technological issue. Yes, it's technology which is driving some of these challenges, but the, the broader questions are around the culture that sits around that technology and that technology operates within. And I think that's where we need to challenge this most. Yeah. Thank you, Jen. Um, I think we're probably out of time now. Uh, do you have any any last takeaways that people um, could have from this? Oh, it's too bad, Gordon. You asked a great question. Um, I'll just say very quickly in the last thirty <laughs> seconds, instead of giving giving my takeaways, um, we have seen. Um, evidence of that resistance, Gordon, and not just in terms of. Uh, resistance to giving citizens or customers giving data, but citizens or customers using the technology that organizations want them to use and, and simply not moving on to digital services. Um, so it, it, it's beyond our intuition and, and is a, a problem that um, government and, and non-government clients are aware of. Um, and then there's, I think also, some active resistance in terms of sabotage in some cases that we've seen as well, where people um, give bad data or false data to to move along in a in an application process or something um, because they have to, but they don't want to, and and that causes systemic and longer term problems for government organizations. And we see that even when there is an implicit value proposition like not having to enter your data multiple times and saving saving time by just doing it once and, and then being able to access a service. So um, it is a known challenge to where organizations of all kinds want to go to answer your question. Um, 
So Kevin, I'll leave the, the last word to you. What about what's your key takeaway for our <laughs> audience today? Well, thank you. I, I probably banged on about it enough already, but it, but it, it repeats, it, it bears repeating. And that is that this is not, although technology has helped to bring these issues to the forefront, the solution is not a technology solution. We have new, we have new laws coming in. Uh, we have this raising in people's awareness with chat GPT and BARD and others. You know, technology is rarely out of the news at the moment and particularly around ethical considerations. And of course, Facebook being fined, I think was it yesterday or Monday, um, a huge amount. Uh, so technology is there, people are aware of it. People are saying they want it to be ethical. It's up to us to make sure that it is ethical. But again, that's not a technical solution. It is a social and cultural solution. And we need to be thinking in those big picture end-to-end -end systemic ways rather than just looking for technical fixes to technical problems i would suggest we we have lots more questions there i would love to go through them all but we we're limited to 45 minutes and um i would say you know i think you probably got gens of my emails if not they are available from the soccer stereo website so do reach out to us and we will quite happily take up any questions that you have and respond to those in more time but otherwise, thank you ever so much for your attention. Um, I hope this has been useful for you and enjoy the rest of your day. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot. Goodbye.